Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, it's truly, truly a pleasure to be here. I I, I walked in and, and Kelly said, uh, you're going to introduce Michelle. And I said, oh, well, what a plan for something. And then <laughs> since then, uh, I, you know, I've mentioned to a few people and they keep putting little jokes in my ear. Um, I even got a text from Brian Sorseth who says that I'm supposed to pick on Michelle mercilessly. Oh. Uh, but, but, but I'm not going to do that. Um, it, it's actually a really strong, it's a great pleasure to introduce Michelle because not only has she been a friend for very many years, um, I actually think she represents and her journey to getting here represents something that I think is uniquely and interestingly Canadian and in some ways unique to the Conservative Party of Canada. And, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, Stephen mentioned that I've been an activist for a long, long time and, and, and like a lot of you in the room, I probably started off by paying attention to politics and then about 2000 I started doing politics as a volunteer and did, did 10 years of volunteer work. And it was during that time that I first met Michelle Rempel who in many ways was the uber volunteer for, for so many things in Alberta. And Michelle is now a Minister of the Crown. And that's something special about Canada. You can be a normal everyday citizen, decide that you care, decide that you learn, you want to learn about politics, get busy doing it, and climb all the way to the top without being worth millions, without having to know anybody special, without having to do anything special. She did it. So let me tell you a little bit about how she did it. She comes from a background in, uh, in the executive sector in uh, academia. and. Uh, she started to pay attention and realize, you know, all these government people actually make the decisions that drive the things that the people I work for end up having to do. So better start paying attention to those things. And, you know, she became a board member, and then a riding president, and then a riding president who volunteered to be on a policy committee, and a national policy committee. She chaired and started the first Alberta's Congress, the co-chair for it. She went out and did a whole bunch of things just by engaging in the political game and she's made a tremendous difference and it was it was with some pleasure a few years ago that uh, I remember getting a call from Michelle uh, an opportunity had presented itself for maybe a by-election should she do it shouldn't she do it um, someday you know when, when she's retired from politics uh, I'll, I'll write a book about these calls I've transcribed them all they're, uh, they're, 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 they're quite special um, and, and, and occasionally a little crazy, in my life. but like a whole bunch of normal everyday Canadians, she asked herself the question, you know, can I do this? Would it be good for me to do this? And my answer to her, as it should be to a whole bunch of you, is yeah, if you want to do it, you should try it. And Michelle Rempel went out there and threw her hat in the ring, got elected, went to Ottawa, worked hard, and has continued to climb. And it's my pleasure today to introduce her to come up here and talk to us about the future of the party and the future as we get ready for another election and for you to hear her wisdom and understand that not all that long ago she was sitting in rooms like this listening to people speak and that's kind of special and Canada's a special place and Michelle is a special person but this is the place where we can do that so with that it's my pleasure to introduce one of the hardest working people in all of politics and one of the most committed and thoughtful conservatives that I know, uh, Minister Michelle Rempel. For those of you who were at our uh, party convention, you'll remember that I took a swipe at Vitor from the stage, so I was expecting retribution this morning. <laughs> so thank you for being so charitable in your hometown. Um, and thank you for that very kind introduction. I've known Vitor for years, and he's one of the people who has gotten me to where I am. And so for that, I'm thankful. Um, you know, I was asked to talk this morning about what it takes to win. And within that context, I, I want to talk to you about a different issue. Um, and, and it's something that some of you are going to be seized with later today, I understand, in a forum that you're having. And it's a question of if our democracy is broken in Canada. My answer is this, our democracy is only as broken 
as the ungathered will it takes from any one of us sitting in this room to articulate a problem, convince others that it exists, and utilize the tools which already exist in this country to fix it. So in other words, our democracy is only as broken as we personally choose it to be. One of my colleagues uh, was, had the enormous privilege of going with the Prime Minister to Israel uh, on the trip last week, and I, I got a call uh, from him, and he's kind of a rugged kind of cowboy guy, and um, he was really moved about something. They had just been to a gathering area for Syrian refugees, and he had personally witnessed 350 people emerge from the desert after a three-day trek through the desert uh, with only their clothes on their back, uh, fleeing from the regime that was in that country. And um, he, was, he was really moved because among those people was uh, a woman who was well in her 80s, who had walked through the desert on a in a cane to, to, to flee a, an oppressive regime. Um, that's a broken political system. When you have to walk through the desert because there's no recourse to fix your system, uh, that's what I would argue a political, broken political system is. A system that doesn't serve its people and where its people have no ability or tools or mechanism to fix it. In fact, they're oppressed if they try to. This is not the case in Canada. You know, I, I find it very offensive that people have tried to claim that somehow, uh, even though, you know, through, through the discussions and political ideology or how we manage things, that somehow our democracy is broken. And, and I think that we have to start looking inwards when we have this conversation and take ownership on ourselves because we don't have to walk through the desert to do things. As Vitor mentioned, we all have the power to do that from sitting right here in this room right now. You know, people always ask me, why did you run? Vitor sort of alluded to that. Because I can. Because I can, I run. I am a young woman who has the ability to sit in our House of Governance, stand up and speak for the principles that I believe in, that my constituents believe in, that people have worked for years in terms of our political movement, and I get to do that because I can, because I live in Canada. Our democracy. You know, look at the reform movement. Uh, you know, we, we've just celebrated a, a milestone date with that particular movement. And there's other examples in other political parties uh, across political lines in Canada where a group of people said, you know what, we don't like what's happening right now. So we are going to seek to affect change. Uh, here in Alberta, um, you know, we've had we've we've had that sort of movement happen as well. But the the bottom line is is that regardless of your political ideology, every single one of us already has the power to say, I don't like this, I don't believe in this, so I'm going to do something about it. That takes <coughs> constitution and moral moral fortitude. Because there are consequences to that, right? Challenging the status quo certainly has consequences. But the ability is there for us to do that already. And you know, I look, if, if we look again to the reform movement, there, there, was a, there was a change there. There's been an evolution in the conservative movement since that time. But look, as a movement, at what we've achieved. We have a majority government. What did we set out to do in that movement? Bring the voice of Western Canada into the governance of party, uh, the governance of Canada. We are there. We've eliminated the wheat board. We've eliminated the long gun registry. All of these things have happened because we've articulated a goal and moved these things forward. And you know, we don't. You don't have to use a particular. Uh, partisan ideology to talk about affecting change in Canada. You can do this from any, any particular partisan lens. I'm, you know, I'm obviously conservative. But my point today is that when we ask if our democracy is broken, we need to ask if we have the will to continue to change it. You know, we can perceive, we can look at our democracy, the state of it, in two ways. We can say, you know, uh, there's huge apathy among Canadians. Uh, we see, you know, we have political leaders who are corrupt. We see people that lapse into complacency. Or we can say that we have people who have chosen to affect change. We have people who serve in our EDAs to do so. We have people who are average rank and file citizens that take the time to write me and their local officials to express. I think we have to be very careful on which lens we choose to look 
at our democracy from. And I would argue that it's the latter that we should be doing, not the former. Because the state of our democracy and the state of our party and our viability, any party's viability in terms of election, is its ability to look inwards and have its members ask if they have the constitution to have a long-term vision and to implement it. And political engagement is exercising a choice which already exists. As a party member, I have, as Vitor mentioned, the ability to affect policy change, to develop our party governance, to put together forms in which we talk, to challenge my candidate, challenge my MP, challenge the leader as a party member. Now, as a member of parliament, I have the ability to sit in my caucus. For those of you who don't know what a caucus is, it's a group of all of the MPs that are in a, a certain party. And we meet every week. Uh, and, and challenge legislation that comes forward. I sit with ministers and I say, hey, you know what, have you thought about this perspective? I talk to my EDA, I get feedback, I am constantly asking whether or not we're doing something or a, commenting on the process because I have that ability, it's part of my job and I choose to exercise it. That ability already exists. This is where good policy development, good communications, and good long-term strategy comes from. And I think that we have to, again, look inwards when we're saying, are we broken? What are some of the issues facing us? And how do we resolve them? How do we look at them over a long-term lens? The nature of leadership. You cannot make everyone happy all of the time. It's just the way it is. Leadership is about trade-offs, but trade-offs in terms of achieving a long-term vision. You know, one of the um, one of the analogies someone who is very senior, probably the most senior person in our party, uh, uses very frequently is one of sort of a big aircraft carrier, right? If you turn the sorry for all the naval people in the room, steering wheel. <laughs> at 180 degrees, you're going to capsize that thing, right? Like, you have to be very careful about how you affect change. But if you do things one degree at a time, pointing towards a destination in the distance, you are going to get there. And you're going to bring all that mass along with you. You are going to affect change. And that's what leadership is. You know, there have been things that I just personally have not agreed with in terms of some of the decisions we've made. But over time, I see, wow, OK, I understand why we did that. Or you know what, I've talked to someone and say, OK, there's, there's a different context here. That's what leadership is. You know, It's very easy for us to be populist, because being populist means being popular a lot of the times. And sometimes being a leader doesn't mean being popular. It means people are going to disagree with you. I think the rub and the trick with leadership is having a thick enough skin that you can push away the maliciousness that comes with this job, but not so thick that you can't take that criticism that's value-added, that's meaningful, and internalize it and make good decisions, that you don't lose your soul. And you know, I certainly think that um, our Prime Minister has those qualities, and that's why I'm proud to serve with him, because he gets that. You know, I, I, I talked, one of my colleagues is Mark Strahl, uh, who's just, just a vibrant, wonderful person. And um, he, he talked, he told me the story of his dad. Many of you know uh, Chuck and what happened, um, you know, it's one of the more tumultuous periods of the conservative movement of late when they left the caucus. You know, he told me that his dad was willing to lose it all because he believed in something. He left that caucus and because he didn't agree. and. You know, I, I have to ask, was that a turning point in our movement? Like, did he, you know, Chuck knew what the consequences of his, his actions were going to be there, and he left. And I'm not presenting it in terms of, you know, right or wrong or this or that, but the point is he made a choice based on the tools that were available and how he thought he could best represent the people that he uh, was elected to do so. And there were consequences because of that action, both for him and for our movement. So I guess what I'm saying is, I just want to impart to you all, when you look at the state of our democracy, look at the fact that we all have the ability in our own way to make our own decisions and affect change from within. You know, I have to a ask myself what would happen if Chuck Strahl had made his decision via a legislated approach rather than a personal ownership choice. The question that we're currently faced with within our party is whether we should try to legislate character. 
that's it's, it's, it's as simple as that for me. You know, some of the things that we could be doing, I, you know, certainly there's no political party in this country that is perfect. You certainly we all try to sell ourselves as that. But there are things that we can do. You know, when I look internally right now, I think that, you know, we should all be putting the onus on our caucus more often to engage more directly with our membership, um, to really take a look at how we, as a party, ramp up that policy development process, which is good, but make it more, uh, less static and less on a two-year cycle and make it more part of our legislative process. Uh, we shouldn't be sh shying away from taboo topics. Um, there's a way to deal with taboo topics, by the way. It doesn't have to be blown up in the media or the front page. It can be done internally, but we shouldn't shy away from them. We should encourage, as a party, fulsome debate in the House of Commons. Throw away the notes. Know your files. Know what you're voting on. Encourage people to do that. We should have that active dialogue between our caucus and our EDAs. I know we, we have a lot of that already, but it should be something that we enshrine all the time and encourage because it's so healthy. You know, we should look at some of our communications approaches as a party. We've done so much for this country. Uh, yet, you know, I, I was chatting with a colleague this morning, and sometimes, you know, he said, sometimes we snatch victory or defeat from the jaws of victory. How do, how do we talk about and how do we tell Canadians what we've done in a meaningful way such that they understand what amazing place Canada is right now uh, because of the policies of our government? You know, and, and how do we encourage a corporate culture across our party, across our membership, within our staff, within government, such that one of the number one things that we value is dissent, positive dissent, mm -hmm. saying, hey, you know, have you thought about this angle? Have you thought this through? Hey, you know, like that, that discussion that makes good policy. And I think that that's there. Because I see it in our caucus meetings, I see it in our committee meetings, I see it in our EDA boards, but how, how do we crystallize that such to the fact that it, it's, everybody understands that this is happening? Those are the questions that we should be asking. You know, how do we educate our members? How do we acknowledge that we can't make everyone happy all the time while building a broad vo voter co coalition? How do we increase personal freedoms without increasing bureaucracy. And those are the questions that we should be seized with when we look at the long-term viability of the conservative movement. What isn't helpful? Removing the right of our members to govern our political parties and instead giving that authority to Parliament and Elections Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Right now there's a bill in front of Parliament that would change the Elections Canada Act to state, in the event of a conflict or inconsistency between a provision of the Act and a provision of this Act and a provision of the Constitution or bylaws of a registered party, the provision of this Act prevails to the extent of the conflict of consistency. Now what does that mean? <laughs> It means that Parliament has the ability to change the governing documents of our parties. Ooh. It's as simple as that. Now, in the context of this bill, it's to a very particular piece, but the fact is it applies, that one clause applies to the whole Act. So what's to stop a government down the road from through Parliament changing th across the board political parties' governance? You mean wiping out the Senate? It's, it's, it's actually something that you should all be very concerned about because there is uh, a great deal of support for this particular piece of legislation. How do we incent Canadians to participate in the political process if we take away their ability to make their own decisions on how parties are governed? Can you imagine standing in front of our membership at a convention during a constitution debate and saying, oh yeah, we can pass this, but Parliament can change it because of this legislation that we just passed. I'm not going to do that. I will not do that. Because I am an activist in this party and I've spent a decade of my life fighting for the very process by which we govern ourselves. You would not ever tolerate me as a representative of you if I said that the government should legislate going concerns of this country. And political parties are going concerns of our democracy. We should not be taking that right away from citizens of Canada. Here, here. What else isn't helpful? You know, uh, many of you will raise your eyebrows at me for saying this, but I, I actually do think that there are good people in the parliamentary press gallery. There are. 
And um, I think that there, but I do think that there is a pressure in our media because it's a very tough business. It's very small margins, and there is pressure to publish sexy stories. And you know, I, I talk to folks in the press gallery, and you know, a couple of them have been as blunt to say, you know, I'd have you on my show, Rampel, but no one cares about hearing about that policy. And it's true. It's not a sexy story to hear about, you know, innovation policy in Western Canada. But damn, is it ever important? Yeah. The the, the point is, is that if someone falls out of favor with their peers in Ottawa, and who is part of a, a media narrative which sort of says that, they're in danger of being voted off the island under this legislation. You know, we see this narrative already with the Prime Minister, with leaders of the opposition party, with cabinet members, with rank and file MPs. There is a narrative that is written uh, that uh, around this sort of activity and I just that's so distracts from what we should be doing in Ottawa now should some of that be covered is it news sure I, I can't disagree with that but is it the main purpose of why we're in Ottawa and what we should be focusing on no so why would we incent through legislation something that would enshrine backstabbing in in our caucus I just can't buy into that because I think that what we've been tasked to do out there is more important, um, more important than that. There's legislation in front of the House of Commons that would allow members of Parliament to be expelled from their caucus triggered by a blind vote of only 15% of their peers. So let's say that, um, Lori, you voted contrary uh, to the government on a bill based on your constituency wishes and your personal moral fortitude. You've consulted with your EDAs. It would only take 24 members of our caucus right now, according to my math, last night on the plane at 10 o'clock, in secret, in a secret ballot, to trigger a membership review. In the interim, that small group, before the vote happens, could leak to the media that this was occurring, and a debate on the members' viability would play out in the court of public opinion, not in our membership, and without the leader's ability to prevent this. In a more extreme example, let's say someone, some in the Liberal caucus were not impressed with their leader's decision yesterday and decided, you know what? You expelled all these people out of the Senate, let's expel you. It only takes six in that case in a secret ballot. There's no criteria for this review in this bill. It could be anything. It could be, I don't like you. <coughs> that's, not, that's not democracy. That's not putting responsibility in the hands of our membership. The nature of leadership and caucus is that 15% of any group of people are upset about something or another all the time. <laughs> yeah. It's just the way it is. And you know what, that's good, because that, cr that triggers that dissent, that good policy discussion, that change. That's, that's, that's part of the engine of how we develop policy in this country. It should be an engine for policy development, not for court politics. That's not what I signed up for, and it shouldn't be what you signed up for either. As conservatives, we have long stood for the fundamental rights such as being innocent until proven guilty and being able to confront one ac accuser. A secret ballot system for caucus expulsion triggered by a minority of caucus and fueled by tabloid journalism incents cowardice. Yes. It's unbecoming of par parliamentarians. Don't be too bold, don't piss anyone off, don't be too smart, don't be too forceful, don't be too successful, lest ye be judged by your anonymous peers. <laughs> if I have a problem with my leadership or a caucus peer, I have the right to voice it. I have the right to confront my caucus colleague and say, I don't like what you're doing, and the leader does too, but there's consequences for that. I need to be accountable for that decision, and the leader needs to be accountable too. In our current system, a caucus member is not removed lightly because it is, it's not healthy for our party if it's done poorly, and also because it needs to be explained to our membership, and our membership is accountable because they vote for the leader. I just, I, I find this behind closed doors, uh, no consultation with membership approach, anti-democratic at its very, very core. And you should be very concerned about this yes. as a party membership. You know, if we had a contested leadership race 
and all of a sudden, um, you know, the, the, a faction within that that leadership race that didn't win, could they just go into caucus right away and then oust the leader because the person who they didn't like didn't win under some guise? There's no timelines associated with this bill. I, I, I just, it's, it's. I understand where the debate is coming from, but this is not a debate for Parliament. This is a debate for our membership. This needs to happen at a party convention. Where were these where were these non, these I, these issues in our last party convention? It was just in October. Where were they? I'm sorry. I just I, I read this bill as an activist, and it it really makes me angry. I did not hear a vigorous debate on this issue at our convention, and why not? Look to your left and look to your right. Every card-carrying member of our party has the right to propose constitutional amendments, including our caucus members. We, they have the right to a vigorous debate process. We, in Alberta, we have Alberta Congress, where we have several meetings of our, our political party within this province. There are so many opportunities to affect the governance of our party. Let's have that debate there. I don't have the right as a caucus member to do that to you. I just don't. That's your right as a party member. You know, make no mistake, this legislation does not strengthen our democracy. It makes it weaker because you, we've taken away the rights of the party member to make governance decisions. So no, Danny, your vote in the leadership matters not. Caucus will handle it for you. We got your back. Kelly, forget about writing that policy. Big Brother has it covered. And Stephen Delansky, don't bother building that strong uh, neutral nominating committee because Elections Canada is now going to overlook our nominating processes. You've probably surmised that the bill I'm referring to is the Reform Act, a table by a very bright and considerate and thoughtful colleague of mine. I, I'm actually quite glad that he tabled it because it has sparked a debate on what democracy means in Canada and I think that that's a good thing. But it neglects the fact that the tools to enable and affect change in our political system already exist and in fact reside where they should, within the hands of our members. I fundamentally believe that we as party members Want to, want to change how, if we want to change how leadership reviews are triggered, how MPs are selected, and how and when our internal rules are enforced, and how caucus functions, it should be done at a party convention, not with 160 plus caucus members, without, represent, without representatives from non-held ridings. Edmonton, Strathcona, you don't have a say right now in the government, governance of, C, of the CPC under this piece of legislation. The other, the other, um, I just got a few more points that I'd like to make that are fairly technical, but for those of you in the room that are responsible for running EDAs, I really want you to have a think about these. We don't have caucus in all upcoming 338 ridings, as much as I'd like to. We don't. So how do those riding, how do those members have a voice under this system? Um, one of the Liberal members has actually proposed an amendment to the bill already saying many riding associations are so small that they are not representative and thus not demographic. Well, what's too small? And what are the list of other exemptions under this? It starts getting tricky. The nomination officer under this bill, instead of having a joint process by which the party, the central party and the EDA select a candidate, uh, all the power is consolidated in one nominating officer. Parties would be forced by this law to endorse any candidate signed off on by the nomination officer. Our party is comprised by members of across this country who subscribe to a set of ideals, not 30 people in one EDA. It, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's a broader coalition of our, our, our views. So I, I just, I wonder what would happen if a special interest group or a corporation or something decided to put a lot of funds behind taking over an EDA and putting a nominating agent in place. What happens to your MP in that role? Well, all of a sudden, I'm not accountable to my constituents. I'm accountable to special interest group and supporters. And don't poo-poo this, because it actually could happen, I, like, seriously. And, and, and uh, it's something that we should very much guard against. Also, who oversees the selection of this nominating agent? Is it uh, all of a sudden the central party has been removed from that process, so is it Elections Canada? So are we allowing, uh, now are ex asking Elections Canada to be involved in 338 times however many parties nomination contests, nominating office, I just, 
who, who watches the watchman in this situation? I'm, I'm not sure. You know, um, Andrew Coyne from the National Post has been very vocal in support of this, um, in support yeah. of this bill. And he says, it would formalize the convention that party leaders serve only with the confidence of their caucus. But Andrew has obviously never been involved in a political party. Maybe he has. Because if he was, he'd know that party leaders serve by the confidence of their membership. Yes. And we should not take away that, that, that core rule. If we have a problem with our leadership rules, we have it out at convention. On the, um, on the economics of this bill, um, I, I want to make sure that you understand the, the point of liability. Uh, for any of you who have been in politics in Alberta for any length of time, you'll remember the provincial PC nomination in Calgary Montrose, where the EDA was sued by a nomination contestant that they felt that the rules weren't interpreted correctly or there was undue influence. I, I'm not sure the details of the case, but the outcome was um, several I think it was over $100,000, right, Vitor, that was assigned to the, the board members that they were liable for paying. How much, how much liability insurance are your EDAs going to take out to protect you from a nomination agent contest that's gone wrong? Does this incent people to participate in our EDAs, or does it say, I want no part of this because I don't want personal liability? We shouldn't be talking about personal liability when we're looking at our, demo our, our democratic process. I also wonder about the role of Elections Canada in that would all of a sudden come along with this bill. Would Elections Canada officials need to enter caucus meetings, administer caucus votes, adjudicate disputes, and impose penalties for non-compliance, and investigate our EDAs and our political supporters? Would caucus benefits from giving the CEO of Elections Canada a role in administering internal votes based on the removal of leaders? I would argue no. <coughs> Proponents of this bill claim that putting more power in the hands of MPs will increase the connection of the average citizen to government. This is very vague, questionable, and unproven. They do not make a case for what is so overpoweringly wrong with allowing a group of citizens that form parties to make their own decisions, nor do they tell us why it is so critical to make these reforms. Supporters of this bill see it as a fundamental restructuring of power by shifting the balance from party elites to supposedly MPs and their EDAs. But does it actually reform the democratic process, or does it divide and leave parties vulnerable to special interest groups, corporate agendas at the EDA level? It does not force our MPs to focus on their constituents, it forces MPs to focus on their supporters. And of the tight control of party discipline, claiming that dis discipline destroys democracy and, as, and transparency in government, as some of my colleagues have done, the choice still exists to rem self-remove yourself from caucus and sit as an independent. Would caucus peer pressure negate any gains from, in theory, reducing power from the center? That's a question you should ask yourself. This proposal uh, allows a few dozen, perhaps a hundred and most, MPs to cancel the choice of thousands of party members and remove a leader, even a sitting prime minister. It co this contradicts the avowed attempts to increase democracy. The irony of this bill is that it's called the Reform Act, which is exactly the opposite of what the reform movement was started to accomplish. If we are going to win in 2015 and be a party long, healthy, and, and, and successful into the future, we need to stop fighting with each other, look at the tools that we have, and ask how do we grow together. I don't agree with all of you on your views, and you don't agree with me. We don't agree. That is part of the democratic process, but we've come together under a set of principles and guiding philosophy by which we put together a vision to govern the nation. Our roles as members are more than one of just being a donor. We should be looking at how do, we, how do we develop good policy? How do we develop good governance? How do we set that vision? How do we convince Canadians that we are the party? How do we ensure when problems happen in our party and things that we're not happy with, how do we deal with that? How do we address them? That's a healthy family. That, that's what happens. I don't think that we need to legislate that process away from our membership. And I'm talking to you with credibility as someone who has spent 10 years active building those processes in the party. It will be easy for my colleagues, and this, you know, this speech was of my own accord. 
it will be easier for my colleagues to point to me and say, oh, well, she's a cabinet minister, so her point isn't valid. No, I disagree. I disagree completely. Ask anybody who would make that argument how, many how much time they have spent working in an EDA in this party. I know that together we can build a party. We already, we're already there. We've got such a strong base. Do we need to you know, look at where we're going in 10, 15 years? Sure. That's something that's worthy of debate, but we should be able to do that together. So my charge to you is this. When you talk of our democracy today, when you talk about whether or not it's broken, talk about personal ownership. Talk about taking a stand and looking at the, the, the ways that we have within our country right now to encourage political participation, to encourage people to be less, ap ap less apathetic, uh, less complacent, and, and look at how you can do that yourself. As Vitor mentioned, I was 25 years old when I you know, really got involved in politics. Within a year, I was president of a, a riding association. I was chair of our national policy committee at 27 years old. At 30 years old, I was a member of parliament. And at 33, I'm the youngest female cabinet minister in Canadian history. That's the Conservative Party of Canada. Anybody can do that. Don't take that power away from you guys. words, I've said this to this group before, we will not go gently into that good night. I will not, you know, let what everything that we've worked for as a party in terms of, and where we're at as a country, our country is just coming into its own in terms of the international stage. We're taking bold moves in foreign policy. We're the envy of the G7. You know, Forbes magazine just rated us just behind Hong Kong as the best place in the world to do business. We've done this with the work of people that have put their hands to the tiller like you. So, is our democracy broken? Our democracy is vibrant, it's healthy, and it's only as healthy as the people that are involved in it. Thank you.